Uh, hi everyone, this is weird. This takes me back a few years to um, COVID and what have you. But what I thought I'd do is, because I didn't give a huge amount of time to referencing in yesterday's lecture, I put together a small video which would cover what I think you need to know in terms of the basics of APA referencing with a really important set of caveats, right? So yes, I'm gonna tell you what the basics are here and how to go through things and what kind of style APA referencing is and how it works. But also what is most important is that you take this as the basics, the, mod the referencing guide that you've been given to read for the examination, which is next Wednesday, a week today. That is a more important document than this, but I thought, Let's set the scene first of all with this video. And obviously, you know, when you're watching this, put it on 1.5, etc. Rush through it. It's not going to be a big deal. But um, I just wanted to give you the extra support for, um, in particular, this assignment. But most importantly, you're going to be using this referencing system for the next three years. It's really important that you both comprehend why it's being used and how to do it correctly. Because if you do it correctly, you're never gonna be picked up on it. You're never gonna to be told, oh my God, uh, referencing. Get it right first time, everything will be fine. So there are actually many referencing styles out there. You know, uh, We could be using Chicago referencing style, we could be using MLA, we could be using the Harvard referencing style, which is something you've probably heard of. The APA, I actually think, is the easiest to learn and the most simple to use. And as I explained in the lecture yesterday, we don't use the Harvard system because the Harvard system is something really, really specific. And it really applies to um, social science um, as a discipline where you see more use of abstracts in uh, written work. However, the APA system is incredibly similar in, to the Harvard system in terms of how we construct citations which is what happens in our writing and bibliographies which is what happens at the end and i think it's worthwhile just to take a second to explain the difference between these things so when we talk about a citation that is when we are writing something and we cite another author so citations occur as we say in text there are two kinds of uh, citation that we can use the first kind is a narrative citation, and I'll point out exactly what these mean in the video, but we have narrative citations and we have what we call parenthetic um, citations. And as you will know, parentheses means something occurs in brackets. So if a reference is in brackets, that is a parenthetic um, reference. As an introductory statement, as I said yesterday, what you should, you know, you often get asked, what should I reference in an essay? Everything. Everything that you get from another source, you should uh, reference in an essay or a written piece of work. You know, you're gonna do three written pieces of work for this module, for example, and I want you to reference all your sources of information, basically. So in assignment two, you're gonna be doing the summary of William Merrin's um, chapter six from Media Studies 2.0. I want you to reference William Merrin's chapter in your summary, because you've read it, that's where you've got the information from for that uh, exercise from. When you do the referencing, ex uh, sorry, the definitions exercise for assignment three, uh, I want you to go away and look for information to construct a uh, definition of a term or to critique a definition of a term from um, the uh, from ChatGPT. This that's the task itself. We will talk about it more as we get closer to it. But in order to make a critical response to what ChatGPT produces you're going to have to reference the sources of your information for that critique. And for your essay, you're going to have to reference you know, theory, research, etc., and the sources of that information. The best thing that you can do to get this straight right from the beginning is always take a note of where your information came from. Nothing easier than that, okay? In order to do this effectively, what I would suggest you get used to doing is having either a notepad or a document for each doc for each um, exercise you're completing, each assignment you're doing that just has sources and references in it. It's what I do, um, and it works really, really well, and it saves me a huge amount of time when I'm having to put bibliographies together. 
One other point that occurs to me, um, and it's because I was talking about the definitions task for assignment three for MS100. I will often see, and it tends to happen in the first year rather than any other year, I'll often see people um, use dictionaries, for example, as sources of information. So somebody will define a term and they'll give like, you know, Oxford English Dictionary. In reality, now, you can differentiate between academic sources and non-academic sources, but a dictionary kind of falls in a weird space because is it a non-academic source? Not really, because it, it is an acknowledged source of knowledge, but is it an academic source? Yes, of a kind, but it is not specifically academic. And what I mean by that is a dictionary definition is a general definition in language rather than a specific application of a term to a particular subject. So in media studies, we will have, for example, a specific use of the term discourse or a specific use of the term representation. If you were to look that up in the dictionary, it would not necessarily match up with the meaning of the term in the uh, in how we use it in media studies. So as a rule, I suggest that you don't reference dictionaries and sort of encyclopedias like that. Because of this, and because some people are like, oh, how do I find a definition? There is on Canvas a dictionary of media and communication terms. Um, it's there. It's for you to use to download, it's by Watson and Hill. Um, it's in the assignment three information. Please make use of that resource. Anyway, let's move on. Why do we reference? I said this a little bit. I probably said it in really harsh terms in the lecture, so I am sorry about that. But um, the point about credibility is really, really important here. Why do we reference? Well, it dem demonstrates that we um, have done research and we understand the topic area that we're looking at. We acknowledge the use of others to avoid plagiarism. And really, it's the key aspect of what we call academic practice that we and what we mean by that as academic practitioners, we acknowledge and use the work of others and use that work to construct arguments um, which answer questions. That's what academics do. It also enhances the presentation of your work. It shows that you write based on knowledge and enables um, me as a person who's going to be marking your work to look at that work and say, yes, I recognize that you have used an authoritative set of sources in order to construct this answer. That is great. I already know that this essay is going to be really good. But the credibility point does deserve a little bit further explanation, I think. I don't want to sit here and say, right, you guys have no credibility whatsoever, because that's not actually true. You do have some credibility. Um, you have got here, for example, you have done very well in your previous educational um, you know, performance in order to get here. So there is credibility in all that. But credibility in an academic sense is something really specific. And it does mean that we acknowledge who are the key people in a field in order to give our own argument credibility that we know what we're talking about in that area. So credibility here is something quite specific. Um, look, it's a general rule of thumb, but it is one that holds true. The people who don't include either any sources in their essays or include a very limited number or include sources which are non-academic it's not just that that work lacks credibility it's usually not very good either because it doesn't have the requisite understanding and knowledge embedded in the work in order to make it a good mark it kind of all folds into one if you don't reference the right kind of stuff which you're always pointed towards right because that's why we do the module handbooks with the reading lists and give you key reading and so on so you, we are telling you that's what the key stuff is people who don't do that their work, it doesn't just kind of fall down on the idea that the referencing is no good. It's the actual understanding and knowledge in the work is not to the same standard either. Not really usually the standard that we would expect from university students. So that's why referencing is so critical. So what should you reference? Well, everything that you use a source in your essay. This can take some getting used to because some people will think, you know, oh, this is a fact. It is a known fact, therefore, how could I, you know, why do I need to reference it? Well, it's a fact, but we still need to know where you got that factual information from. It, it didn't come from nowhere. Facts didn't, you know, they, they didn't come out the back of your head because you were born with them there. We do need to acknowledge sources. Now, what is a citation? 
Citation is an acknowledgement of other people's uh, work in your work, and it refers to them um, either individually as a group and use and can use a direct quotation. So I'm going to deal with citations first, and I'll deal with bibliographies afterwards. Right now, when we're referencing in text, so we're using citations. The system that we use, APA system, is actually really, really simple. Right. So here we go. This is um, how we cite a single author. It is just author's name followed by the date of publication. So, for example, Gabe 2011 argues that. Now, that's an example of what we call a narrative um, citation. It's what you can see here is we use the name and the date is in uh, brackets. We are discussing Gabe's work specifically in our sentence. So it is part of the narrative of our essay. Um, the system here is really, really straightforward. Name, and that is the family name. No initials. OK, uh, this kind of freaks me out a lot because I, I keep on saying this year after year after year. And then essays will come in and or assessments will come in and it, there's initials of people everywhere. And in your text, there's never anything about that in the APA system. OK, you don't have to put the initials of the person. It is just the family name. So if that person is Mike Williams, you just put Williams. Yeah. I know I'm being really patronising right now, but it, honestly, this happens so much. I feel I have to say it. Name and date. If you're quoting that author, it would be name, date and then the page number, which is separated from the date by um, a colon. I do see in a lot of people's work that they'll have like P75 instead of the colon. Now, technically, that's not the right way of doing it. But I personally don't penalise people for doing that because I recognise that it is constructing a citation, which I can understand. But in, if I was to be absolutely hammered down on the law, it was like, right, I would have to say, right, that's the wrong way of doing it. If you have a longer quote, which is over two lines, what you should do is this. You should um, conclude your sentence, then start a new paragraph, indent it from one indentation from the left and then put that quote in. So just in this um, format here, for example. But just imagine that that's indented. I could have made that an indent to make it clearer. Sorry about that. But uh, that would be indented. Well. Now, my point of caution about long quotes is it's OK to use long quotes, I think. It's not good to use too many of them because that takes up a lot of the word count of an assignment. And it's effectively other pe what other people are saying rather than what you are saying has taken up the word count. What I would recommend you do if you've got one or two uh, long quotes, or, you know, you might think, right, I need to use more. Then I need to think about paraphrasing that work rather than quoting it directly, because otherwise you're just taking up your entire essay with other people's work. When we reference in text, if there are two authors, we cite both, for example, Morris and Scott, 1996. Now, that, my friends, is an example not of a narrative citation, but that is an example of a parenthetic citation because it occurs in parentheses. We would you always see parenthetic um, citations at the end of a sentence. Now, this is also something which is really, really important because People like me, I remember what I was saying yesterday, like it's really important that, you know, you understand that the person who does, you know, writes your assignments and teaches you is the person who's going to mark them. So this is something for me, right? Some people are often, some people, loads of people often will do this. They have a sentence, full stop, and then this reference will come after the full stop. And that makes no sense whatsoever, because basically then you've just made a new sentence, which is just this on its own that's not a sentence that's a citation that belongs to the sentence before so when you are writing these come to the end of your sentence here put this and then the full stop goes there it does freak me out and i do lose my i just lose my shit about it all the time so please stop me from losing stop me from having an embolism and please do that okay if there are more than two, two authors, we use the convention et al. So Williams et al. If there's like Williams, Jones and Smith 2012, we wouldn't list all of them. We just say Williams et al. Um, there are no difference between um, 
books and journals or anything like that. OK, now other things that should become apparent at this point. I don't need to know the title of the book here. I don't need to know the title of the journal here, the title of the paper here. OK, just don't need to know it. It's not part of the referencing system when we do citations. Those details will come in the bibliography. OK, in your writing itself, in your text, all you need to do in terms of citations, names, dates. OK, I talked about this yesterday, but citing sources that have not been read directly. Now, this does happen a lot with undergraduate essays because people will read textbooks, for example. And that's absolutely fine. This, that is not a problem in any way. But um, what we would do is sort of say, OK, this person is the person I'm citing, but it's in this book. And in the bibliography, we just reference the book that we've actually got it from. We don't reference that original work. At this point, what is the key takeaway here? Please, 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 please. When you think about citations, name and date is the key thing. Yes, there are little other things to think about when you've got multiple authors, when you're citing, you know, a quote directly, you need a page number. Then, you know, yeah, OK, I appreciate there are other things, but name and date. No initials, no first names, none of this nonsense, okay? No book titles, no uh, website addresses. I've seen all of this stuff in assessed work last year. It's, this is not like I'm picking out really random examples from the last decade or something like that. This didn't just happen last year. It happened loads last year because people didn't do this stuff. Ah, oh, breathe. Okay, okay. Don't have, don't, don't get too. Don't. Now, in essays, uh, what we encourage is divide bibliographies into text and websites, but with the caveat that you, unless the assignment calls for it, you really shouldn't be using websites as a source. Okay, this kind of, this kind of often freaks people out as well for a couple of reasons. Because one, you might say, right, well, I've read this book or I've read part, I've read part of the book on Google Books or something like that, right? So that's a website. Is that? I appreciate that. I do appreciate that Google Books is a website, but you are not citing the Google Books, you are citing the book which is on Google Books. Cite that, don't cite the website. We don't split into journals and books in uh, bibliographies. Um, sources cited in the main text should always be in a bibliography. If you have something in your main text and it's not in the bibliography, that's a big problem. Um, publications by a single author should come before joint publications by the same, that should say author, not order, sorry about that. Um, that's a really technical point. Don't worry about it too much. But if like you had like Evans 2018 and then Evans and Saker 2018 as well, the Evans one would come first before the Evans and Saker. It rarely happens, but it is worth something using. We don't use at all in the bibliography. We list all the authors. If there are two books or articles by the same author in the same year, we distinguish those by using A, B and C after the date. I'll show an example of what that means shortly. Titles of books and titles of the journal should be in italics, but not the title of the journal paper. Now, it'll make more sense when I show you an example, but titles of books should always be in italics. And here, my friends, is another very important point. Let's say when it comes to January, you're writing an essay for me and you want to talk about, um, I don't know, the Marvel film Black Widow. OK. So you write, you know, Black Widow was a film released in, what was it, 2019, 2020, something like that, starring Scarlett Johansson. Black Widow should be in italics. The t I don't know where this has ever come from, but a lot of people will um, look at that and think, oh, I should put that in quotation marks. It, it's not a quote. It's a title. Titles and quotes are different things. All titles of things in your essay should also be in italics, not in quotation marks or anything similar to that. We're not underlined or anything like that. It's an italicization. Um, and please don't number your bibliography and don't put bullet points for it. That's not the format. It's just no, you know, we don't bullet point each um, bibliography entry. We don't put in number one, two, three, four, five. It, Again, that's something students do, and it's like, I, I don't know where that comes from. It, it doesn't appear anywhere at all. If you want to see what a bibliography looks like, just open any kind of academic book. They've all got them in them. And you can see what one looks like. That will give you an idea of what the format is. Or read any academic journal article. There's a bibliography for it. 
So this is what um, bibliography um, entries look like. And it is really simple. And it, it, I don't want to be horrible, like, but it does give me a, a kind of palpitation sometimes. Something. How can people get this so wrong? Because it's really, really straightforward. But what you've got to remember is I've been doing this for a very long time. So it's really straightforward to me. I appreciate it. it's hard to do something new when you're starting it. So if we have a single author, family name, their initial or initials, if they have more than one, the date, the title of that book, there's a book in this case, right? And the publisher, that's it. So if you like, I'm going to break this down as sort of closely as possible. We have, if you like, five elements to a bibliography entry here. Family name, initial, the date in the, well, I mean year, uh, the title of the book, which should be in italics and should be, will be, always will be, and the publisher. One, two, three, four, five it's not that it's not that bad you know this isn't like learning to drive or something like that this is fairly straightforward if we have more than one author name initial and name initial date title in italics publisher so yeah we've added a name right but that's all we do if it's an edited book name and name we put the term eds here now some people will criticize me here and rightly so and you should hammer me for this because this is actually an incorrect bibliography example because there is no date here i'm not sure why i did that um but i obviously did it in order to illustrate to you what mistakes look like right that is a totally the thing that's going on here and it's not me being inept um in uh, the title of the book in italics and the publisher and if we look at this and hopefully my head is cutting out some of this right uh, we have chapters in an edited book are a little bit more complicated right so we have name initial and name initial date and then the title of the chapter itself comes in uh, quotation marks and then we have in and this is the details of the editors uh, and this is challenging medicine. Now, we don't need to put the date uh, down here because you've already given the date of the book there. All right. OK, so that one's a little bit more complicated. I do appreciate that. Fortunately, it, it actually occurs much less than you would think taking chapters from an edited book, but it does occur. Again, I want to reiterate, you have a guide for all of this, right? All of this information is in the guide. Now, journal articles are slightly different because of that, why I said, you know, we italicize the title of the journal rather than the title of the paper. So here's an example of a journal article citation. We have, uh, you know, a family name, initial, so Ulrich Beck, 2000, date. We have the title of the journal article in uh, quotation mark. And then we have the journal itself in italics. Then we have the volume number, the issue number, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's handy, if you are referencing a journal article, it will almost certainly give you this citation on the title page of it. That's what it's usually listed on there for you. So you can just copy that, or copy and paste it over, whatever you want. Yeah, it, it's nearly always there. We see another example of this year where there's more than one author. The, the overall format will remain exactly the same, but um, we, you know, we just add those names, right? There is no need to actually write the words volume here and number here and pages here. That's not part of the referencing system. We know what these numbers refer to uh, because it's part of the convention of doing the reference in this way. Now, if you're citing websites, uh, it does happen and it does have to happen. Um, it's not often that, you know, I don't, it, I guess it depends on the context in which you're citing the website, right? If you're citing the website as a source of authority, then it's not. But if you're using it as an example, then it's perfectly acceptable. Um, in the essay, identify the websites in brackets. For example, here is um, the website Justice. 
So that's the title of it. If you're referencing BBC, you would say BBC. If you're referencing The Guardian, you would say The Guardian. You would not say www.theguardian.co.uk. That's not the name of the website. That is the address of the website. That is the URL of the website, as I say here. So be careful with this. I want the title of the website in this. OK, now, if that website, if that is an article on a website page, which is written by an author. You cite the author. And, you know, you acknowledge that that has been written by an author. So if you are citing a newspaper article, for example, it is almost certainly the case that you will have an author for that article and you will cite them accordingly. So if you cite different pages from the same website, distinguish them by adding A, B and C after the reference to, in, uh, to the website in the essay. That does occasionally happen, but again, it's, it's fairly rare that that will happen. Um, in, the in the bibliography, we give full details, details for the URL of the website, the data accessed and so on. Now, this is what it looks like in text. Young offenders may receive a range of court orders uh, if they're convicted from referrals, blah, 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 blah. Justice 2012A. So I've got a website, and, um, a web page from that website in A, and then I use another one in the same way. Uh, but it's a different page, so I use B. Um, now, what I want to give you something really important as an update here, and this has been updated in your um, referencing guide. This is the format for doing it, okay? So um, with the website title, the date, disposals is the title of the actual article online, and then we give the URL. And then you'll see this bit here, access 19th of December, 2012. We no longer have to do that. I checked up on this before doing this video and forgot to update this slide, obviously. Another indication of my ineptitude. Sorry about that. Um, but I've done a very quickly updated version of the module um, handbook. Now, you will be pleased to note that there is no reference to this in your um, exam next week anyway. So that I checked the questions. There's nothing here which you have to know about for the exam. I have actually done the exam in APA 7 style properly. But this feature here, we can actually do a gigantic big strike through. Yeah, we can go like that and we can like, no, because we're not using this anymore. And uh, no, because that's not going to happen anymore, because no, we don't need to do that. There's a feature of some referencing um, systems still, um, and it was a big feature of the APA reference systems that you had to say when you accessed it, but we no longer have to do that. So we have to do even less stuff to get this done, which is pretty sweet. If you look at um, an online book, for example, remember I gave the example of Google Books earlier. We would do it like this. So we have the name, the initials, the date, the title. We would add here that it is a uh, book which is online. So you could put that in that format with the square brackets. We give the publisher and we do this and then we don't need that bit there because we just said we don't need that bit. So if you do access from something from Google Books, for example, you would use that. Um, and again, down here with this, and I'm going to cross this out because, yes, uh, if you have a journal article online, you will always have this thing here, a DOI, okay? That is a digital object identifier. All you need to do is give that out um, the available from, and people will be able to access it. It works as a sort of universal system for academic sources, um, as a, you know, a, an address to find them. What is a DOI, a digital object identifier? It's a permanent identifier, so something can always be found on, online. So there's no need to use a uh, URL for that, which makes it a little handier for people who want to trace your sources. Um, now, I guess that's pretty much all I want to say about the referencing so far. Most important thing is, right, how do we reference? Citations come in text, name and date, or name, date and page number. That's all we want, right? or two names, or name at all if it's more than three names. That's what we do, okay? Bibliography entries include name, initial, date, title in italics, publisher, or if it's a journal article, name, initial, date, title of the journal article in question marks, title of the journal in italics, volume, number, page numbers. See, I know it off by heart, guys. Do you know why? Because I've been doing it for ages and it, it, you know, I know it off by heart, basically. Um, 
I don't expect you to know it off by heart. I don't expect you to know it after like in the second week of university that you know this off by heart. But that's why have the bloody guide open and have it there with you when you're doing assignments. Or if you've finished your assignment and you want to check that you've done it right, open up the referencing guide and have a look and check it against the referencing guide. It's that straightforward. It brings me to a potentially thorny issue, which is this. Is there, my friends, a way that you can do this automatically? Yes, there is. There are many, many referencing um, pieces of software available, and some are good and some are bad, like any other kind of software. Um, and they all have the same flaw. Now, if you want my recommendation to me of which referencing software should I use, if you want to use a reference, a piece of referencing software, I would recommend Mendeley. It's a free service and it is pretty accurate in what it does. But I have never seen any kind of referencing um, software that doesn't make mistakes. Basically, all software works in the same way, right? You put inputs into it and you get outputs from it. And what happens very often with referencing software is that the inputs themselves, what they get from websites, journals, books, etc., that data itself hasn't been formatted correctly. And when it's not formatted correctly, the output, i.e. the the reference for you, you know, the bibliography entry that you wanted to generate for you is not going to be correct either. So you still need to know these rules to spot if, if you're going to use those systems, you still need to be able to spot if there's mistakes in them, basically. So you still need to know these rules. Yeah, it saves time, but you know, it's, it's still something you need to check. Do I use that kind of software myself? Hell yeah, of course I do. It saves me time, but I still have to check to see it's done it right. So now I want you to read that guide, which is on Canvas, and you need to show knowledge of this a week today. It says 25 item referencing test there, but uh, no, 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 we don't want 25. We're going to change that to, to actually, oh, look at that writing. Yeah, 20 items. So it's a mark out of 20. Average mark in the past, um, it's actually gone up year on year. And last year was uh, 77%, um, which gives you an indication. That's the average. So if you if you are average, and you don't want to be average, you want to be better than average. But if you're average, you're going to get this, you're going to get a first on this, okay? So um, really, just go and do it. Just ace it. This is the first mark you're going to get in university. And then you can look up to people and say, yeah, I'm like the most amazing university student ever because like i've got like 100 percent first in all my assignments even though this is the first one you have done um i just want to raise a couple of things i'm foreshadowing the lecture next week actually assessment two is a summary task and where do you find more details about this you find them in the module handbook yes in the module handbook just as i was talking about now now what i think you need to do i, I know i'm giving you this referencing task but actually you'll find once you've read the referencing guide a few times and you have it open with you when you do the exam you're going to have no problems here i think you need to start summarizing this article right now so when you've seen this video please start going about doing it this is a really key piece of work in itself the chapter that i've given you but also this is a really key skill this skill is as important as any other that you will learn in the next three years. It's very important to your learning. Revising and reworking commits material to memory, basically, and it helps you learn this stuff. And that's absolutely critical as an academic practitioner. It also occurs to me that I'm now putting a lot of stress on you. And I just want to reiterate a few points from yesterday. Yeah, you've got an assignment due next Wednesday. Obviously, you're sitting the test. And even though I can tell you as much as I like that, you know, it's not a stressful thing to do and you can have as much help as you want and you can do it with other people and, you know, please don't panic. It's still going to cause stress and anxiety. And then you have another assignment due at the beginning of November. And, you know, I'll give you the, as soon as I know the exact hand in dates for that, I will give them to you. Please, 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 please. Um, would you please, if you need help with any of this, even if you think, oh, my God, this sounds so stupid. I feel embarrassed for asking about it. Don't. Nobody's going to judge you in that way. 
right? If you need help on any of these things, please come and see me. Um, I've put here Campus Life will help you, but actually, do you know what? They are there on Keir Hardy Annex, but if you come, if you need any help with stress and anxiety, which is beyond my assistance in helping you with some work, you know where Stephen Services bit is. I hope it's, a, it's a literally under my feet at the moment in um, the Digital Technium building. Please don't suffer in silence and come and speak to us or them, and we can help. Okay. How to succeed then in the next three years. I just want to conclude what we were doing yesterday. First of all, read stuff. The library is not a mythical place. Please read what you're told to do. Attend. Do work in plenty of time. You should start your assignments at least four weeks before. The best assignments always are assignments that I have read. Okay. And what does that mean? Well, it's like I will proofread and give feedback to any assignment as long as it's like one of my modules it was like a pr thing it's like when i don't know about that but if you're doing a module with me i want you to send me drafts i want you to send me things so i can give you feedback so you can make changes to it before you've put it in feedback on assignments is really really important but feedback before you submit is much more important because you can actually act on that before you've done it and you can improve your grade by taking that seriously. Please take the whole thing seriously because this is like a full time job. But most importantly, ask for help when you need it and take advice when you get it and enjoy it because this is supposed to be fun. God damn it. And if you're not having fun, what the hell is going on? Okay. Serenity now. All right. I will see you guys next Tuesday and we will do some more skills based stuff, which is so exciting. And then after that, we'll get on to some really interesting stuff. But until then, I'll see you on Tuesday morning.